everybody, I'm indie fantasy author Melinda Cusera, and we're back with Fantasy Lauren Moore, and today we have A.L. Lawrenson to talk about her fantasy novel, For Evergreens and Aspen Trees, and I've got lots of questions, so let's bring her on. Oh, you're here. Well, welcome. <laughs> and let's, let's, you know, tell us about For Evergreens and Aspen Trees. Yeah, so um, For Evergreens and Aspen Trees, uh, this is my book, baby. I, uh, it took me 14 years to write, so I'm very happy oh, to wow. like have it actually like physically in my hands. Um, I would show off the cover, but this is my uh, author copy that has the bar. Oh, from the okay. So anyway, um, but our main character is Tristan. Um, he um, is a soldier for the king, and they are currently at war with all of the ancient races in the kingdom of Laurelin. Um, and so all the ancient races are the magical races. So you've got your elves, your dwarves, and all that good stuff. Um, Tristan has been a soldier for five years, and that is all he knows about his life. Um, he doesn't remember anything else beforehand, and so he really wants to go and find his memories. Um, but because being a soldier is all he knows, that's all he does because he doesn't know what to do. Um, until one day we have an elf break into his fort that he lives in, uh, and his whole world just kind of like shatters at his feet. Um, and so he has to finally like pick up his pieces and maybe put aside some differences and finally go and find who he is. Oh, wow. I want to know more about the elf sneaking into it. <laughs> there's got, there's gotta be a good reason for that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. Well, why don't we meet him? Well, not, maybe not the elf just yet, but, um, <laughs> the main character thinks his name was Trist. I'm bad with names. So forgive me. Okay. No <laughs> No worries at all. Um, all right, so he does. So I'm actually gonna read. Um, I've got a little bit of a forward and then a prologue. Okay. Um, he does appear in this, but he is not the main character of the prologue. Um, the main character of the prologue is actually one of my favorite characters, um, but they stay pretty uh, shrouded for a good long time. So, all right, we ready to start whenever you are. Go ahead. Get a drink of my water in my red solo cup. I think we allow <laughs> that. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Three laws govern the magic of Alshalon. One, magic may not be given to those without, lest it become a curse upon their heads. Two, magic bound is magic beaten. Three, the dead must remain with the dead. These laws were intended to protect the weak and balance the powerful. They were well-intentioned choices made by well-intentioned beings. However, as is often the heartbreaking case, even the best of intentions can be turned against us. In all my years studying the history of this world, the ancient laws have caused more pain, sorrow, manipulation, and bloodshed than I believe those original lawmakers ever intended. Jay Lashton, the Nature of Enduring Warfare, 12th edition, page three. Prologue. The waves crashed in overwhelming dissonance, reminiscent of the mourning dragon cries the bard witnessed countless years ago. The smells of ocean salt and iron tangled in the watery light of early morning. Pockets of water riddled the valley, their waves spitting sparks of light and carving deep wounds in their beaches. From the bard's mountain perch amidst shattered rocks and uprooted trees, the lakes looked like so many fallen scales, like the ones she had seen that day of fire and ash so long ago, the day she wished to forget. The bodies scattered across the valley now, staining the lake's crimson, did nothing to banish those memories. Too many lives wasted. The jagged scar on the bard's eyelids burned. She half expected warm arms to draw her close and a chin to rest on her shoulder while deep, soft words of comfort thrummed in her ears. Instead, a bitter wind laughed as it whipped around her and tossed her dust-worn skirts. A stake of loneliness pounded into her chest. The war had cost too much. The bard waited, humming a tune of better days with eyes shallow, erratic, and labored. Whoa, good grief, I totally skipped a page. <laughs> it's like, wait a second, sorry, let's try that again. The bard waited humming a tune of better days with eyes closed, and listened to the thrum of the earth and the beat of the lives upon it. There had to be one voice still out on that bitter battlefield, just one, and she would wait for it. 
Despite the songs she sang and stories she told of heroes rushing into battle unfettered, she could not carve that same path. It was her fate and her curse to wait, only wait, until someone reached out to her. And there, carried across an urgent wind, the call came. Help him, someone help him, please. She was on her feet in an instant. Jaw set, the bard clasped the strap of her lute close to her chest and slid into the valley. She winced as she tripped over loose roots and trod on shards of debris, but she kept her course to the carnage below. So many dead lay abandoned in the valley. The dead must remain with the dead. She knew that better than anyone. But if she could save even one life before death could stake its claim. When she reached the mountain's base, she removed her boots. The waterlogged earth seeped between her toes, cold and sorrowful. The loss and heartbreak swirling in the murk overwhelmed the bard and brought tears to her eyes. She breathed in until her chest ached from the strain and then let the breath and emotions pass through her until they dissipated. She listened. Three heartbeats throbbed through the earth, two weak and fading. The other one, a shudder ran through her. Seething was the only way she could describe it a paltry word that came nowhere near its full presence. She had lost track of the years since she had last felt something so dark. She needed to complete her work before that thing overtook her. She kept careful watch on that presence and focused on the cries she had heard. Please, if there is a God anywhere, please help him. She ran swift as wing beats across the crimson ground. She dodged fallen bodies and plunged her feet into icy pockets of sea until she found her a broken girl all alone at the edge of the battlefield. Bodies piled around her like fallen leaves. Her blade was stained with blood almost as deep as the blood flooding the back of her tunic. The bard approached, not daring to hope the girl was still conscious, but she was mistaken. The girl snatched at the bard's skirts as soon as she saw them. Please, a sob tore through her throat. Congealed blood dribbled from her, how, wow. Congealed blood dribbled from her mouth. Please help him. He's out there. He, he can't die. I promised him. The bard crouched and put her hand over the girls. Shh, all will be well. I will help you and then find your friend. No, the girl's vehemence startled the bard. Him first. He cannot die. He can't. I understand. I will help you if you only ask. No, I, I don't deserve help. More sobs racked her body dead all dead because of me i i killed them i killed them all her eyes fluttered her consciousness waning please please save him the bard's throat hitched in frustration she could save them both if the girl wasn't so stubborn but without that critical request for help she knew her curse's limits all too well biting back a retort she placed her hand on the girl's feverish forehead I will help him. The pain melted from the girl's body. Her eyes finally closed. Thank you. A last whisper before her body fell still. Not dead, but dancing along the edge treacherous line. The bard fought back tears as she stood and searched for the other weakened heartbeat, the only other survivor. Of all the wide-eyed young soldiers around her, only two remained. The ground shuddered, a lingering sob over the lost. The bard found her target and ran to the other end of the battlefield. She met a gruesome sight at the end of her trail. Despite the countless battlefields she had seen, she would never be used to the gore they left behind. Her stomach churned at the agonized young soldier. Drenched, drenched to his shoulders in his own blood, his breathing was shallow, erratic, and labored. The whites of his eyes shone stark against the crimson as they rolled in his head. His limbs twitched, either reaching for the sword at his side or in the final throes of death. His life force spilled undeterred from a gaping hole in his head where half his skull had caved in on itself. She suspected a mace to be the culprit. The bard tucked her legs beneath her and cradled the soldier's head in her lap. He moaned and gurgled blood and spittle. His arms shook to fight her, or so she assumed. The bard hushed him as she would a terrified child and pressed her hand to his skull. Blood dripped between her fingers and left trails down her arms. She tucked him tighter against her, heart aching, and hummed. Gold light illuminated her skin and seeped into the wound. 
The instant her magic touched him, a green mist leapt to life and battled the bard's hand away. She tilted her head and let her magic fade into her bones for a moment. The gold light died. When it did, the mist receded to a spot on the young man's chest beneath his tunic. She pulled back the fabric and found a silver ring on a leather cord. A homemade talisman. It glowed green the closer she came, but its light was fading. The caster was dying. The girl. Someone loves you very much. The bard brushed blood-crusted hair from her patient's forehead. Talismans are no small thing. She touched the ring. It burned bright and hot. At least, it would have for anyone other than herself. She allowed her magic to flow through her fingertips. Hush, you have done what you can to protect him, she said in the ancient tongue, the rich cadence-like language of magic. It would share her message with its wielder. I will do what I can to save him, as I promised. The ring continued to burn bright and fierce, pulsing as, pulsing as fast as an anxious heart. It matched the other heartbeat's tempo she sensed elsewhere on the battlefield. The bard hummed again and stroked the ring's curve. All will be well, she said. All will be well. The fight left the talisman's caster with a slow and agonizing withdrawal. The ring's glow faded to almost nothing and the protective mist disappeared. The bard kissed the ring and wasted no more time. She had a promise to keep. Golden flames encased her body as she placed her hands on the young man's wound. The song the earth had sung to her through the wind, trees, grass, and soil every night for the past three months tumbled from her lips, focusing her magic. A ruler will rise to vanquish the night, to bring evil's demise and bring all to right. To death they will fly, and to earth they return. The laws they defy before this world burns. Blood of sorcerer, blood of saint, shall become the restorer and cure earth's blackest taint. Thrice failed is thrice cursed. If good does not prevail, then earth shall see its worst. Movement interrupted her. Stumbling, shuffling, the air thick with the stench of defeat and vengeance. Seething hatred washed from the lake's mist and solidified into a single presence. It had returned. Fine hairs along the barred spine stood on end. You must leave, Sister Earth whispered to her. You cannot be lost. A thick shield of fog rolled in. The bard suspected it came as a gift from her worried friend. She checked her patient. Though still bleeding, his skull had been repaired. He breathed deep and even, and his limbs had quieted. Although not fully healed, she had gotten him through the worst of it. He would live. Whatever vile thing headed her way continued to shuffle closer. She hesitated, unwilling to leave the young man behind, but Sister Earth urged her away, echoing her words to the nameless caster. All will be well. All will be well. Her friend had yet to steer her wrong. She departed, melting back into the mountain mountainside and leaving the grisly battlefield behind her. As she picked her way back up the mountainside, she chanced one last glance back. The seething presence crouched beside her charge, examining his face and checking for signs of life. Frustration, fury, desperate opportunity. They all flowed from the presence, the man, though only just, as inexorably as the waves against their shores. He stood and looked across the battlefield, and at that moment the bard saw a flash of bone-white blade a sword strapped to his waist. Dread thrummed through the bard and summoned goose flesh along her arms. She had not seen that sword for centuries, knew it had been too much to ask to never see it again. Leave, the earth begged. Leave before it claims your soul. The sword wheeler gathered the boy in his arms like he might a sack of flour for barter and limped away from the battlefield. The bard closed her eyes, heart aching, resenting her inability to intervene. All will be well, the earth whispered to her once more. All will be well. That's it. Oh, wow. I love that um, the repetition of the all will be well and the, the taint and the um, saint. The, the, I love the right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> but if you're like doing some kind of spell, I kind of feel like rhyming is like necessary. <laughs> that yeah. that oh, yeah. little, it has that little like you know, audio signature. I'm if you know it like says, "Hey, I'm a spell." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and maybe that's too much like Harry Potter, or well, actually, I think they went left like Latin or something. But, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that that was great. I really enjoyed that. That was great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now that was the prologue and chapter one. Uh, so that was the so I had a little like forward. Um, yeah. So it was a forward, and then it was the prologue. Oh, so that wasn't okay. So that wasn't chapter one. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter one, we open up with Tristan. I see. So we haven't found him yet. Right. He was. He was in there. He was our. Uh, Poor sad sap that she helped out, but um, yeah, no, he's uh, he's for later. <laughs> I see. So is that so? That's so. It, all right. So you said that twenty years of war stole his family. So this is like twenty years ago, and chapter one is twenty years later, which is the present. Right? Uh, so or did the I, did war, I math the that right? Been, <laughs> the war has been lasting for fifteen, twenty-ish years. Um, this is this prologue is about five years before present day. Okay. So this is five years. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, and then next chapter is present day. Yep. Gotcha. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. All right. Where's my questions? All right. So you still haven't explained the title though. Why Forever Greens and Aspen Trees? Where does that come from? Forever Greens and Aspen Trees. Um, that comes in. So Tristan has um, two rings that he wears. Um, so the cover of my book has two rings on it, a gold one and a silver one. Um, the silver one he has from before, like the end of what he remembers. Um, and so he keeps that with him. And then the gold one was one given to him by a warlock to try to like help him bring his memories back. Um, the silver one that it has some writing on the inside of it that he can't quite read. Um, but when he like holds it and touches it, um, it whispers this phrase to him over and over again, which is for evergreens and aspen trees. Ah, so we have to read the book to find out what that means. Or do we do we find out in book one what that means? Or is that we something? We find that out in revealed? book one what that means. Okay. So yep. that, that's something we're not gonna spoil. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's your right as the author. It's my job to ask as the interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Tristan is clinging to the his past and but he wants the truth. And so I oh I okay, so uh, I think there was something in your blurb about an elven woman named Aspen. Is that yeah. you have something to do with the evergreens and Aspen trees? I'm going to keep asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, so her name, her name is Aspen. So, I mean, we've got Aspen and Aspen. So Did we meet her oh. in the prologue. Was that Aspen? Uh, you'll have to read to find out. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So we're not going to get the answer to who that was in the prologue. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, but yeah, so she, um, she is a, a soldier for the rebellion. Um, and they are the one, like, they're all the ancient races that are like, Hey, this is kind of like our kingdom and our home too. And we have a right to be here. Um, and so she obviously is very much at odds with Tristan, um, when they first meet because they are they don't like each other even a little bit and they're not supposed to because they are complete opposites in this war. So. So, all right. So what is this rebellion about? Like, how did this war come about? Like yeah. what's the central conflict and who's on each side? Yeah, for sure. So our central conflict is um, this started with what is called the day of bluest blood. Um, and so the current King, um, he dethroned the, um, the ruler and his wife and their kids and everything else. Um, he went through and he just decimated the entire family. Um, and his, his claim was, Hey, they're inefficient rulers. They haven't been doing anything good for the kingdom. Um, and they've been harboring these horrible, awful, um, magical users that have caused us nothing but grief and strife and are way more powerful than we are. And they can, 
you know, hurt us way more than we can hurt them and all that stuff. Um, and so he, his name is Osman. King Osman um, is the current king of Lorland. Um, the rebellion is actually called the Princess Rebellion um, because during the day of bluest blood, um, the king and queen had several children. Um, one of their younger princes, who was like four at the time, um, one of their uh, advisors found him um, and ran away with him um, to the Golden Grove, which is the main hub of like kind of the elven community. Um, they're one of the bigger networks of magic. And so he ran there the day of bluest blood um, and they harbored him. And so obviously this prince has grown up safe and secure and everything else. Um, and so they're like, hey, we have an actual legitimate claim to the throne. You cannot be here. Um, so we're going to rebel against you to regain the throne that should have been this prince's to begin with. Um, however, in this book, we find out that the prince has died, um, but they have never found the body. Um, and so uh, there, there's still strife. The, the common folk, they're like, this war has been dragging on for so long. We just want it to be done and over with. We really don't care who the winner is at this point because we're all starving and suffering. The yeah. king obviously is still like, no, we can't have this. And then the rebellion is like, no, we can't live like this either. Um, and so that's kind of the main conflict is just trying to reclaim this kingdom to what either party feels it should be. Um, so it sounds like they've been fighting so long that whatever they were fighting for doesn't matter anymore. Exactly. It's, now we're just entrenched in our side needs to win. Essentially, yes. And obviously, like, there are still people that, like, fight for right on either side uh, or what they feel is right. But then there are others that are just like, you know, it's an old grudge. So we've got to got to push through. Um, Tristan actually is part of a fort, um, it is the only fort that is um, the house's only like common folk so it's all the merchants and the the farmers and everything else and the king several years ago um decided to set this fort up as like a uh, morale boost for the little guy you're know, like hey look you have people fighting for you too that like are just like you rather than all of our, my knights and whatever else um and that has done absolutely nothing because they don't do anything they don't know what they're doing um and the common folk are like Listen, 20 years is not going to be saved by a couple ambassadors. Sorry. Sorry, pal. So <laughs> that's kind of where we're at with that. Wow. So we need we need peace somehow. But exactly. Yeah. It doesn't sound like there's an easy path to it. Nope. So, all right. So you said you've got elves. Um, what other fantasy races do you have? Do you have any cool twists on them? Or are they... Um, are they what we've seen before? Yeah, so um, elves and dwarves and all those things, those are the what they call the ancient races. Um, but there were primordial races um, and then uh, a race called the architects. Um, so the architects are essentially just these giants that created this whole world of Al Shalon. Um, and then there's kingdoms inside of it, whatever else. Um, the architects had... Um, and this is some of, you know, their um, religious beliefs and everything else. Um, according to them and their lore, they um, believe that, you know, the architects built this world um, and then, and, you know, gave magic to them and made it a, a great place for them to be. And then the, um, the architect's mother, um, who they call Mother Night, um, became jealous of the world. Um, and so she came and, you know, wanted to tear it apart. And the architects are like, heck no, like we, we made this, like we wanted this to be like an homage to you because you created us. And so we wanted to create this beautiful thing. Um, and so they get into this big fight and all the architects fall and die. Um, however, during this war, and then Mother Night is torn from the heavens and the stars that are left in the sky are pieces of her great big um, wings that she had. Um, and so the remnants of her wings are the stars. Um, and the uh, the architects, again, rumored, there's no, like, this is just the religious theology that they've come up with. 
Um, at one point, the architects made the primordial races, which were um, the god race, um, the phoenix clan, and then the dragonkin. Um, and so we have, you know, gods that were in charge of a lot of things, and then the, the dragons and the phoenixes were in charge of protecting the human race. Um, however, um, because they were all so powerful, um, they eventually kind of like battle each other to extinction. Um, and so now all that's left is kind of the remnants, which are um, the ancient races. And so we've got the elves and the dwarves, and there was a, um, a race called the Elanwin, um, and they had, they were just winged people, um, but they turned a little bit bonkers. And so, uh, they died out, <laughs> wow. um, but yeah. And so that's how we end up with our races. Now, um, we also have half bloods, um, you know, so races intermingling and everything. Um, but because of the ancient law that, um, you know, you should not create others like you or give magic to those without, um, a lot of the pure blood races, um, look down on them because they're like, you're a curse. You should not be here. Um, we don't like you. You need to go away. Um, and so that's kind of where all of that is at. Oh, wow. All right. So let me see if I got this straight. So the architects yeah. made the world. And when Mother Night fell, the pieces of her wings are the stars in the night sky. So right. what is the sun and the moon in their theology? If her pieces of her wings are the stars, mm -hmm. then... So the sun yeah. and the moon were um, things that were created by the architects to give um, life and beauty to this world that they created. Um, and so the um, the sun was hung in the sky and the eternal flames from it is what, you know, made phoenixes be able to regenerate and everything else. And then things happened with that. And the, the dragons were jealous because they wanted that flame. And so that's how they kind of got into their own thing. And then the moon obviously was there as a beautiful reflection and mirror of the sun um, to give them light even at night. That's really cool. I like, that's a really cool way of cosmologically explaining the universe. I love yeah. that. I love that the moon yeah. is a reflection of the sun. That's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it does reflect the sunlight, but we often don't think about that. That's, yeah. that's like such a cool, like interweaving of like actual fact with like, I love it. Thank you. No, that's very cool. All right, so we've got the architects, and then we've got the phoenixes and the dragons, and then we have the elves and the dwarves. And how elves they come and dwarves and, the, and we've got naiads and dryads and you know, all those other things. So the architects made them. Yeah, so the architects uh, made them as it, it kind of like, because the architects fell um, after their battle with Mother Night. Um, and so but some of their magic was still like leftover. Um, and so their leftover magic is kind of what developed and built into these other races. Okay. So they weren't there. They were created. They came into right. The ancient after... races were not the primordial races were, they were created before the architects fell. And then after the architects fell is when the other ones came to be. And what about humans? When did non-magical humans come about? Ah, so the humans actually have been there from the beginning. So they're a primordial race? Yeah. So did the architects create them? That is to be determined in the- Oh, other. I see. So we have to <laughs> wait on that one. Yep. So do humans have magic? Uh, there are sorcerers that have magic, um, but not all humans do. Do um, all elves and um, yes. other races have it? Okay. Yes. Uh, the half-bloods are kind of like iffy because it just depends on what sort of mix they got. Um, but yeah, all the other races do have magic. So how come if the humans are primordial, they didn't, they don't all have magic all the time? Or do they have magic and it's just a different kind? Oh, okay. That's <laughs> now I'm curious. <laughs> do we find the answer to that in this book or in another nope. book? Nope. That'll be, that'll be a ways down the line. Okay, so is that is that book out yet? That where the answer is? Or no. You're still... So currently, I only have book one out. Um, book two will be coming out um, this fall, and then I also have an anthology of some short stories and some poetry, all set in the same world that will build up some more of the lore, um, tell more of the stories of it, um, and that will be coming out this summer. Oh wow! Very cool. Yep. That's very cool. Thank you. 
All right. We talked about the war. We've talked about elves. So what about monsters? Did you have Ooh. monsters? <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. So we have, um, we have something, and I won't, I won't share the name of it, but Tristan is plagued by something. They are these big, spindly, gross, like pale monsters with these huge lidless eyes and like rotting rows of teeth and everything. And they just like whisper and are creepy and just hang out in like his nightmares and everything else. And they, they come into play into this one. Um, I also have demons um, and demons are fun. They come more into the second one, although if I'm remembering correctly, I believe, yeah, they are mentioned a little bit in the first book. Um, there's a, a demon queen and then some other ones, but they've, they're also kind of just like hiding. Nobody's really seen them for a while. Um, but they're there. Um, we have these ones, these ones. So this book took me 14 years to write. And so throughout the process, I've had things like come and go as my um, imagination and my world building has grown and developed. Um, one of the ones that's like hung on for a good minute, it it's mentioned again in this one, but doesn't like necessarily come in. Um, they're called sabers. They're these huge like wolf-like creatures, but they're about the size of a bear and they're like all hunched and weird like hyenas. Um, they travel in packs. Um, some of them are venomous, which one of the characters is like, why, why is that necessary? <laughs> and they're like, oh, wow. Well, it's a huge thing. Like, why not? So um, yeah, I mean, favors. aren't the claws and teeth enough? <laughs> the <laughs> exactly. size and strength? Exactly. No, let's make it venomous uh, too. We've got the sabers. We've got shades, which are um, remnants and pieces of um, the soul of a demon um and there's a there's a sea monster that helps like cart a boat from uh the mainland of laurel into its capital uh he just kind of hangs out in the ocean and luckily he's under control right now but they don't know how long that's gonna last so <laughs> we've got oh and then there's um also the sirac is what they're called um they so there's the golden grove and then around the outside of it there is this forest called the woods of desolation um it's completely dead um and there's this like weird nebulous like just presence magic thing hanging out there um, a lot of people believe that it is the remnants of some lost god um but it's like this really gross um fog that you can't see through and inside of the fog um the sirac live and they are um, they describe them as cousins of the sirens, um, but they're skate. They kind of look like um, cold lava almost. So they've got like the weird scaly, like black bodies and stuff with fiery hair. Um, and they um, tempt you into the mist with things that you really, really want from your life. Um, and then once you get lost there, they can feed off of your sadness and misery until you are gone. So, oh wow! Is there any way to get out? Um, if somebody finds you and they like grab you and ground you back to reality, then yes. But otherwise, no. And not otherwise many people are far far enough in to go and save everybody. Oh wow! Oh wow! That's wild. <laughs> so, all right. So then, what kind of magic do the elves have? So the elves, um, it's kind of stereotypical magical magic for the elves, um, but they can control, you know, plants and um, trees and things like that. Um, they can also shape shift. Um, so they'll often turn into animals that are um, native to the forests and things that they live in. Um, they also, um, so part of what they help do for the rebellion is they do help grow like crops and things to feed the soldiers um, as well as to try to help feed some of the surrounding um, villages and towns. Um, so that's what they do. The The dwarves have dominion over rocks and the earth and things like that. Um, and then naiads have control over the water and dryads have control over like more of their trees and things. And so it, it those follow pretty stereotypical patterns um, for a lot of those races. Um, the sorcerers um, can't, if, if they practice enough and are powerful enough, they can um, use a lot of those different elements interchangeably. 
Oh, that's cool. So they're not limited or locked into any specific, um, like elemental magic or anything. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. That's very cool. You mentioned dragons and phoenixes. Did they disappear when the architects did? Um, so they um, disappeared several hundred years later. Um, but there's there's still like remnants of them hanging out. Like um, there are. So there were the great dragons and they were the like huge, huge ones, but there are lesser dragons that hang out. Like there's little pygmy dragons that live in uh, wildflowers um, and all those other things. And then the phoenixes, um, they left some of their like civilizations behind. Um, the phoenixes can shift into like human form. Um, and so some of their civilizations are left behind and the ruins of that, um, but they're completely gone as well. And how did they die out? That is part of another oh. series. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, on top of this book, I also have um, a Kindle Vela that I'm working on. I don't know if you're familiar with that platform. Um, but that tells the story of um, a phoenix. And so it's her story, her life. Um, and you can find that there. And then eventually you will find out what happened to the phoenixes. So. And just for, um, in case listeners are not aware, like Kindle Vela is a serial publishing platform that's owned by Amazon and you can get to it from amazon.com in various ways. I think you can, I think now you can link your Kindle Vela to your author profile so they yeah, can actually exactly. go to your author page. They could just search for you and find it that way. Yeah. And uh, the first three episodes are free. After that, you pay one token per hundred words. And I believe the tokens are... Um, I think a, a thousand tokens is like 10 bucks or something. Yeah, something like that. They're they're fairly inexpensive. And if you're a brand new reader to Kindle Vela, um, you can, once you've read the first three and you like swipe into the first unlocked one, um, Amazon will give you 200 tokens for free, which will get oh, you- Oh, they're like, still doing that. Okay. Episodes or so, yeah. Oh, okay. Because I didn't know if they'd stop doing that. As far um, as I'm aware, um, within the- like just a month or two that's i was still aware that that was a thing that they were doing so yeah but that story is called song of ash um and so that is one that you can find on my page and it's really fun it's one that i've been sitting on for a while so i'm excited to start sharing it on that platform no that's cool is that going to be standalone or is that going to be part of like a trilogy or an ongoing series I am, or I'm, I'm not sure where I'm this character is going to go <laughs> yeah so i i know the storyline and i know where the character is going to go i'm um, the really beautiful thing about kindle vela is you can um focus a lot more on like characters and some of like the side things that they do it doesn't have to be quite as streamlined as a book is and then obviously you can take those and you can turn them into a book and so you can make it more of a book format um so really what I'm trying to decide is I'm like, I, I know my beginning and I know my end and obviously I know how they get there. Um, it's just the determining how, how much time do I want to spend on these particular things? Um, so it, it could end up being a standalone or it could end up being like a trilogy or something like that. So I'm, I'm still in the determining part of that, but that's the other nice thing about Kindle is I can experiment and get immediate feedback from readers on what they want. So. So you're keeping your options open. <laughs> Exactly. Your relationship We're not exclusive yet. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. No, that's very cool. I, I have experimented a bit with Kindle Vella, but I I write books. Trying to write I used to write serials in like the 2010s mm -hmm. on my website, but like I got into like books and like, it's, just, it's a different mindset writing series and, and is. just worrying about what are we doing for this next thousand words. And, and like you said, you can include all the side quests and things and you, which you wouldn't want to do. And you would put the side quests somewhere else and not put them in the main book. Exactly. Yeah. It's a totally different mindset. And I'm like, just, I just can't go back to that. I've written too many books. <laughs> I'm too, like, my brain now thinks in, like, book format. Act yeah. one, act two, act three. In, like, 90,000 word chunks. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, I try to keep things from sprawling. They become their own book. And then they can sprawl all they like. Yep. As long as yeah, there's three acts and a conflict. <laughs> no, oh, no, 100%. And I think... I mean, so far, I, I haven't gotten very far into this fella. Um, I, I started it and then, um, and obviously had like lots of backlog for it and had that, which was great. 
Um, but then I got sucked into writing book two and this other anthology and everything. And so that's kind of taken a back burner. Um, and I'm, I'm still working on it, obviously, but we're, we're still seeing like, if this is a platform I actually like or not. Um, I, I love the platform itself, but like a writing platform for me, yeah, um, it works with my writing style or not. So we'll see. The thing I do like about it is it does keep me accountable um to writing sometimes i get into the oh i can i can write it later um mentality especially if i get like tired or burned out from my day job um so it it helps keep me accountable and at least keeps me writing every single day which is good yeah i know that's how i got into writing serials in 2015 and 2014 yep. because it i it having that discipline and the people came to read it and i was like oh well now i gotta keep going yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. and that's the part of the thing too is Currently, Kindevel is a little bit harder to get traction on, and so I haven't had a ton of readers over there yet. And so I'm like, okay, if I'm not getting my readers there, I should probably prioritize some other things until I can get them over there. So that's why I like ended up like um, ending the experiment because I just couldn't get um, too much traction over there, and it was like, I, books are where it's at for me. So yep. and it makes sense. Like I, I stopped doing the like serial stuff in like 2015 and started doing the books and that's where the the audience is but like I still like I like that you can publish a chapter like as after you know and and put it out there like right yeah. after you write it like yeah. and I love to write so like it I use I write four chapters a week sometimes more because I just I love it yeah. And yeah. I have to keep the characters in line. If I don't like constantly like put down what they are doing, they change the plot on me. Like oh, absolutely. right now they're currently trying to get a trilogy out. It was like, dudes, no, this was supposed to be a standalone to explain <laughs> something that I just don't understand why you did in another book. <laughs> and you convinced me we needed a book to explain this. That you needed to show how we, you know, like, and, and you still haven't gotten to the part where you sh explain why you did the thing you did. Yep. You were like, miles away from it still and yes this is cool what you were doing but i need to know we still need to get to the thing you promised you would do and i'm like yeah. oh well maybe we can do it in the next book maybe it'll be a duology and i'm like no dude that's no. not how it works <laughs> yeah, no i uh, it's it's in the queue it's, it's not like how it works when your characters get their own like life and personality because you know you've written them well but it's also the worst because you're like, listen, I had plans. And they're like, yes. no, you not anymore. You don't. We yes. have our own deal. Yes. And here the we more go. characters you have, the more they can rebel. Exactly. Because they team up. Oh my gosh. Yes, it's terrible. I have I have five series and I'm in well, the characters in this current book that just supposed to be standalone are trying to make it a six series. So I have about 20 char main characters like main and like like major supporting characters yep. and like when they rebel man i can't get them to do anything that was in the outline sometimes they're worse than like real actual live children yes <laughs> i've written whole books because they wouldn't do the thing that i wanted and they're like well if you let us do this in the next book and they string me along and and it's been now where uh, I just published book 10 in one series. They still haven't done this one thing they keep promising me. I got them to do another thing. It took nine books, but we got the revelation in finally. <laughs> and yep. now I want my freaking joust. And they were supposed to do it in book 10. They're like, no, we got to show the, you know, the aftermath of the revelation. And now there's this weird magical crystal that I don't know where it came from. Yep. And now we need to chase some dragons. <laughs> why can't i have my joust now they're like we'll do it in book 12 and i'm like i just want my joust please I wrote all this story 10 years ago <laughs> over 10 years ago. yeah 10 years ago and, and like either no it, it might have been more than that it was either 2010 or 2012 somewhere in there i wrote like part of this this cool this joust story and like that's this whole thing but then you look at him and you're like oh Look, my babies are whole grown up. Look at them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were fun. Like, I do have to admit, what they wanted to do in book 10 was a lot of fun. I did very yeah. much enjoy that. But I want my joust. And you're going to have it. <laughs> it's going to happen eventually. <laughs> we have to save my, you know, I have many favorite characters. We have to save the queen. We, we, yes. need, we need the joust. We need to save the queen. We just... Yep. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> But I can't get to the joust until I finish this 
this either the standalone, this trilogy, whatever it's trying to become, to explain yeah. what they're doing in another book that's in another series, because those characters, it was it's a prequel, and they some of them showed up and were like giving my character hell in another series in mm -hmm. the present day. And I can't explain what the heck is going on. <laughs> so, I, yeah, that's yep. my current like. That's my current reality. I love it. I hope I that it. yours is less crazy. It's hippie. I mean, so this the second book that I just finished and sent off to an editor. Um, read book one and book two were originally meant to be all one book. Um. And then I I finished it and realized that like I was not giving justice enough to either like half of it, um, and so it needed to be split into two parts, which I'm fine with. I'm like, that's that's okay. That means I can get this first one done and out, and then I can like really focus on this other one. Um, the problem is so again, this book took me 14 years to write, which means that this other book has taken me even longer because they were all like thought together in the same space. I just didn't like have that one necessarily like mm -hmm. written down the way it needed to be now. Um, however, I sat down to write it and it immediately decided to take a whole like 80 <laughs> and go a completely different direction. I'm like, what? Totally Why? Know how that Why? is. I thought that this was going to be the easiest book ever to nope. write. It was horrible. Nope. And I, I felt so bad. Nope. Okay. Listen, like if any of you are like any other authors out there or aspiring authors, like just know, like treat your editors like they are precious precious gifts because they are i sent this um manuscript to my editor and i like i almost cried because <laughs> it was not the way i wanted it to be and that's what editing is for um and i just said i'm sorry this is this is a, a garbage mess right now and i know you're gonna fix it but like i the characters just did not want to work with me so i have made them do something and i know you're gonna help me make them do greater things but here it is <laughs> Yeah, no, and it, it's gonna be better. It's it's gonna be fine, and it's gonna be great for when it's published. But at the time, I was like, mm -hmm, I can't fight with them anymore. Please, somebody else take this from me. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I've been there many times, and yep. currently right there. There, I'm currently dealing with that right now. <laughs> Not with the editor, but with the unruly characters. Yep, it's like herding cats sometimes. <laughs> it seriously is though. And then they'll be like, hey, I brought this friend over just to let you know. Uh, here they are. Now you have to write them too. And I'm like, oh, yeah, great. <laughs> or they fight with you about their names because mm -hmm. they walk in or they're supposed to have a certain backstory and they walk onto the page and they're like, no, my name is this. This is my backstory. I don't care if you needed the other backstory for important plot reasons. You can't have it. That's not who I am. And no, I'm no. Like, oh, God. <laughs> I still need this other, you know, somebody with this background for important plot reasons. Now I've got to find somebody else. Yep, exactly. Exactly. It's like central casting sometimes. <laughs> I imagine that's what it's like when you're casting for a TV show. I've never been a part oh, of any God. of that, but like I imagine it's pretty similar. It's pretty similar yeah, I, in a lot of ways. In my head it is, but who knows if in reality <laughs> it's at all like that. <laughs> Nobody knows. Is there anything else you want to say about evergreens and aspen trees? Oh gosh, uh, I have so many things to say about this book because yeah, I just love it. Like I, I spent so long on this book and it really became like, like my place, you know. And um, I think one of the things I love best about this book is um, the characters themselves. Um, I mean, I love the lore. I love the lore, and I love that I have this world now that I can tell these stories in um, and it's really easy to pull from because that world is so fleshed out for me. Um, but really what makes it, despite how often we gripe about it or whatever else is the characters. Um, and I I love these characters. They, um, I, I feel like they're nuanced and they're real people um, in a lot of ways. And obviously like there's, there's some differences in that because it is fiction and there is some understanding of like, you don't want it to necessarily be exact like reality. Um, but I just love them because they're, they're fun. They, for most of them, they want to do the right thing. Obviously there's the ones that don't even a little bit, which is, they're also kind of fun to write. Um, but I, 
yeah, I just love that they they want to do the right thing and they they genuinely care about the people around them um, and they want to do right by them. Um, there's a lot of focus on like friendship and love and family throughout this series um, because, you know, that's important to me and I think that's important to the human experience. Um, and so I, I just love seeing each character's interpretation of that and how they take care of each other um, and how they they want to change the world um, for the best that like they can make it. So I just, I love them a lot. They are very close to my heart. And it's fun because I get to be sassy and snarky um, on page. And even though sometimes I'm not very good at being sassy and snarky in the moment, I can do that on page. And I have all my good one-liners in the book. And so I'm like, there we go. I can put that into somebody else. <laughs> That's awesome. So... All right, so we've got the Kindle Vela, which is, I guess, sort of like a prequel situation. Yep. And we have book one out. Book two is with your editor. Are you writing book three? Um, so book three right now is on a little bit of a hold um, because I'm also finishing up the anthology. Um, oh, and right. I am also submitting another short story to a different anthology that um, I am not publishing, but um, another independent author that I know of is like, getting a collective of us and we're all publishing together. So I've got a couple other projects for the next like month or two um, that I need to finish up and solidify. Um, once all of that stuff is fully done, um, then yes, book three is well on its way. Um, luckily, I, again, I, in my brain, I know where book three is going, but characters are going to have their own ideas on it. Mm -hmm. um, but That's yeah, where the negotiation the, and the compromise and the begging. <laughs> Mostly it's us authors doing the bank, like, please yeah, just please. do this one just thing. One thing. Like, That's all I ask. Yep. You know, readers so, will be sad if you don't do this. <laughs> oh, we 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 pull out the the big guns. Oh, <laughs> we yeah, are absolutely. not afraid. Yeah, not, that's also when you tell them, listen, I know where your family lives. I know the family yeah. members that you still like. <laughs> could kill you. Exactly. <laughs> you are a fictional I, I character. You, you exist arm. because I want you to. <laughs> yeah. So um, then they clap back with like, yeah, but I'm your favorite character. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, damn. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, damn it, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. So book three will be fun because um that's one that I actually like haven't done any drafting for like book one and book two I've had those drafts because that book has existed for forever um and so book three will be fun because it's a whole new adventure and experience um and I think it's really going to push me in a lot of ways um but it'll be good it'll be good and I'm very excited about it um and the entire series I plan to have five books um for it and then there's going to be a couple like little novellas or other short stories and things kind of thrown into the mix. And then, um, so there's Laura Lynn is the kingdom. And then there's the bigger world of Al Shalon. Um, and after this series is done, I already have plans for several other series to go and explore the whole rest of the world and everything. And so it, it'll be a good time. And I'm very, very excited. No, that's cool. Cause it sounds like this is a world that's very deep with lots going on and lots to explore. So that's, I'm glad that you're going to be exploring it. <laughs> we'll look forward to hearing more about that in the future, where you go and what those new stories are. You're always welcome back anytime. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming. So fun. You've been so fun to chat with. I'm glad I get to geek out about like my favorite thing on the planet, which is writing and then like my own books and getting to geek out with somebody else that loves stories and lore and everything them. else like, oh it's so <laughs> it's so fun being a writer is like the best thing you meet the best people you get to do really cool things um and you get to wear your pajamas while you do it if you want to <laughs> and you also but you also on the flip side have to figure out how to get your characters out of the jams that they get into yes <laughs> and you've you characters you've read any jungle. book out there right now you know they could get into some pretty crazy gems <laughs> yes They're depending on us to figure out how to get them out of it <laughs> yep. and sometimes you gotta sit there and you're like listen a character is smarter than i am how am i supposed to write a character that's smarter than i am <laughs> right right i have a tactical genius in one of my books and i'm like okay what's this how? guy gonna do now <laughs> how am i gonna figure this out i'm not a tactical genius <laughs> Thankfully, yep. he's human, and humans make mistakes. So. 
Yeah, no, all the time. Basically, I have a couple like plans in my book where they fully admit outright. They're like, this is stupid. I have no idea what I'm doing, but we're going to do it because we are desperate. And so that's what they do. It usually involves them like just running straight into danger without a care in the world because they're like, we got nothing else. So here we go. And I'm like, you know what? As long as they acknowledge it's stupid, I think we're fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, like, if, if the character's, like, immortal or already dead, then running into danger, like, they don't have to acknowledge it's stupid because there really isn't the same consequences. I have a few it's characters true. like that. Like, they can't die. They're already dead. So, yep. it's like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> so they kind of acknowledge that. They're like, well, yeah, I don't really have a reason not to do this. <laughs> So I'm going to do it anyway. One of the usual reasons just don't apply in my situation. So <laughs> let's go see what happens. <laughs> exactly. Like I have this character in the book I'm writing now who like uh, another character convinces them, like in the first chapter, like this is totally not a spoiler, to uh, to go into the library for forbidden knowledge in hell. He's already in hell. So it's like, and he's like, you know, she could be lying. This could be a trap from, you know, the devil. But I was like, he's like, you know what? I don't actually care because I have nothing better to do. <laughs> I'm already dead. What are they going to do to me? So yeah, I'm going to break in there. And then he's like, I have no idea how to sneak in there as a former ex-god of war. And he's like, I've never actually stuck into or broke into anything in my life. <laughs> oh, so it becomes this like the next couple of chapters are just they were really fun and I was laughing while writing them because there's this dude who's just like, I have no idea. I'm supposed to be sneaky, but like how do you do that? <laughs> I'm <trying> my best. <laughs> how do you sneak past people? How do you like pretend to be a servant so they don't like throw you out so you found the thing? And how do you find something in a library that's cursed and doesn't want you to find it and is twisting and throwing obstacles at you and so it becomes this like wild adventure for him because he's like way out of his comfort zone but now he's so like angry at the situation he's like i have to do this now <laughs> there's no quitting i'm going to figure this out the library's not going that that was a lot of fun to write <laughs> i have to admit it wasn't i don't it wasn't supposed to be a part of this book but Again, characters. You yep. can't live with them. And if you really like them, you can't bump them off either. So no. you're kind of stuck with your shenanigans. And sometimes you also can't bump up the characters that you hate, even though you really want to. They, oh, yes. They need to exist for a reason. You're like, ah. well, you can bump them off, but you need a character to do it. And sometimes exactly. it takes a while. You know, you can't. Sometimes it just takes a while. Yep. I had this one villain that I really hated, but I could not get rid of them because they could not get the characters to get rid of him. <laughs> they didn't have the, well, like, you know, it was a complicated magical situation. They didn't have yeah. the right skills. They didn't have the right the magic. They had literally no way to do it. It was like an impossible situation until they finally, like, figured out, you know, found a way to do it. But, like, in the meantime, I'm stuck with this, like, character that I really don't like. <laughs> Doing things that I really don't like to my favorite magical places. You're like, no, I'm sorry. So I, I accidentally made him too powerful and didn't give them a way to, yeah. Eventually we found a way. That's, that's good. And you can always tell the magical places, hey, we'll, we'll rebuild you later. You'll be better. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I have my character doing that. He's not happy about it. But I'm like, you know, look, you gotta, you didn't get rid of him fast enough. Now you have to clean up the mess. I'm sorry. It's your own dang fault. Sorry, pal. <laughs> you know, you're the one who lost your magic like in the middle of this when you were supposed to be stopping him like and then you had to take time to get it back I mean yep. what were you expecting he was going to sit on his rocking chair and just like leave everybody Wait alone for you to get get by right? like... it took days for you to get your magic back I mean you know he, he was busy during that time he's a villain <laughs> he had plans he had things to do yeah he listen he's got a girl boss hard okay <laughs> Unfortunately, the main character of that book is a pacifist. So. Also that. Also and that. a sweetheart. But, you know, he got the job done with help from other people. There you go. Um, it just took, you know, it just took several books. <laughs> Which was not the plan. But he wasn't supposed to lose his magic, but he made the wrong decision. And I was like, uh, I can't save go. you from this one, buddy. You're just going to have to learn your lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to figure out how to get your magic back because... 
I have no idea how you. No, who that, knows? Yeah. That was a problem that it took a year to solve. We could not figure out how to get his magic oh, back oh and keep him alive God. while he's trying to get it back with everything that was going on. It was like, yep. okay. Those problems are the worst. Worst. Yeah. But then they feel so good when you solve them. It like, was. One itch and you're just like, oh, finally. I got it's great it. when yep. like, you're rereading your own stuff and you realize the answer was in book two. And you're like, I totally forgot that I put that there. <laughs> that is my favorite. I'll sometimes, like I've had to go through this book a couple times. Um, I'm working on an audio book with the narrator. And so I've like read through the book as he's been reading it just to make sure we've got the you know recording all done and stuff. Um, and yeah, I'll like go through it and I'll just like sneakily like highlight stuff as I'm reading through it. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. And like, mm -hmm. and I'm like, that makes my job for the next book so easy. Yeah, it's yeah. great. I'm glad you have notes. Like I didn't. So like, I was just like, I'm going to reread this. I'm going to find, <laughs> I'm going to see if there was anything, you know, or if anything comes to mind. And it was yeah. there, it was at the end of book two. I was like, oh. I forgot they were in the river. <laughs> they were literally the antithesis of one of the problems they were facing. And I was like, oh, I completely forgot there that was there. <laughs> and they were like, not far from it either in the same underground area. Like, I was like, oh, I totally forgot that was there. They should be <laughs> doing something. Because <laughs> I, I I read a lot about like balance, like checks mm -hmm. and balances with like magic and stuff. Yeah. So definitely. like I put these things there and then I forget that they're there. <laughs> <laughs> to then go find them and i'm like didn't i put it's been that many times where i was like didn't i put something to be a check against this if it ever came up later and where did i put it what was it i don't remember yep yeah mm -hmm. you gotta remember your own rules that's what happens when you make a whole world <sighs> it's exhausting sometimes it is i remember most of them but like after 21 books like after a while you're like wait yeah, that, that where did i put it in the ether of your brain for sure yeah i was like which series was it in where did that take place? Could it conceivably be in this other series? Yep. <laughs> and to like chart it out and be like, could this work? <laughs> exactly. That's fun. But you'll have, you if you're going to have, it, which it sounds like multiple series in the same world, you're going to have the same problems that I have. <laughs> I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start forgetting and be like, oh no, what have I done? Yep. <laughs> drop as many cool things that you might need later in the earlier books as you can oh, if yeah. you never come back to them they're just cool things if you ever need them like well Go you know them. it's it's not god in the machine if it was in book two and book two was published for you know two years ago <laughs> yep. it was a thing i forgot was there <laughs> exactly exactly yeah i'm like oh it's it's gonna be a fun time but it it really is it i just I love having all the pieces come together. I feel like Kronk, like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's all yeah. coming together. Like it's, it's, it's it just, is. it's so satisfying to have each of these little pieces that you've like strewn around eventually like come full circle. Um, and sometimes even like, I mean, I purposely foreshadow for things to come because you're an author and you want to do that. You want all of your endings and everything to make sense with what you've set up to begin with. Um, but I'll even like sometimes go back and as I'm reading through or doing whatever else, I'm like, Oh, I forgot that I said that there. That was so good. That's perfect for like what I needed for the other thing. And like, yeah, it's great. It's, it's really cool to be surprised by your own brain. Yeah, no, I have been many times and it's even cooler when like you said something like a throwaway line in, in one of the earlier books that you weren't foreshadowing. It was a neat <laughs> idea you had at the time. And then you're writing some later book and you remember the neat idea and that becomes part of it. And then you're reading through the series and you're like, Oh crap. I, I didn't, I wasn't foreshadowing when I put that in there. It was just a cool thing that I just happened to remember later. <laughs> well, yep. That's fun yep. too. That's I've had great. a few of those um, situations come up like accidental foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. Or like, even if there's moments from the other books, I'm like, I really liked that moment and I think I should go and revisit like it helps me like buffer up the other stuff later is it's great and you can call back to like have a scene in which I like to do in another book oh, that yeah. um is sort of like a companion scene to that one mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah I have a um a minor character die in book one um and then in book two like it's it's like you don't think he matters to anybody but then in book two like he's He's mentioned and like people are sad and it's like 
Oh, so it. He had yeah. a whole life. He was a whole life. He was an NPC, but he lived, and yep. he, his life touched others. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's very cool. Well, thank you so much again for coming. Yeah, <laughs> I hope you come back. <laughs> Happy to do it. I will come back anytime. This has been so excellent. I'm happy. Thanks. Yeah. And I think that's going to do it for this episode. We've been talking with A.L. Lawrenson. I'm Melinda Grisera, your indie fantasy author. You've been listening to Fantasy Lore and More. And today we were talking about Forever Greens and Aspens. And in the show notes of the description, depending on where you're listening or watching, will be links to the book and where you can find A.L. Lawrenson if you want to follow her. And that's a wrap. Have a great day or a great night, wherever you happen to be.